Hi, listener. This is from Ideology to Unity, a spiritual journey where we let go of ideological doctrine and ego in favor of meaning, purpose, and unity as a whole. Today, I'm interviewing Thipan from the YouTube channel Nexus Void. Nexus Void delves into topics such as philosophy of mind, theology, metaphysics, regular physics, and repressed knowledge. Hi, how are you doing? I'm well. Uh, I'm well. How are you? Pretty good. Yeah. So, it's a lot going on in the world right now, eh? Oh, yeah, definitely. Quite tumultuous times. Um, one, so there's a lot of uh, political tribalism happening at the moment, and that's mm-hmm. one of your topics. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Definitely, yeah. And, uh, you know, that's, it, it's, it, it is one of the big dangers of civilization um, that we, we tend to sort of divide ourselves into, into two tribes and sort of project our evil onto the other side and then oh, and sort yeah. of just and sort of see them as the bad guy and we're the good guys and there's nothing wrong with us. All those sort of problems in society are with them. Um, and, you know, everybody's guilty of it and both sides are guilty of it. Um, so it's not one of those things where it's clearly, you know, it's clear who the bad guy is. We you know our brains like narratives where it's, where it's clear there's a good guy and there's a bad guy. You know, that's mm. the basic archetype of stories. But, you know, reality is quite different. Reality is not, it's not that simple at all. I mean, it goes back all the way to Roman times, right? You, for example, like the Optimates and the, the Populares. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, um, I'm sure you're aware of how Carl Jung talked about it. So I'm curious what your thoughts about that are. Yeah, well, Jung himself um, lived through sort of the two great tumultuous events of the 20th century, the First World War and then the Second World War. And so he was able to sort of observe these psychic phenomena where sort of entire populations of people would just get swept away um, by their own unconscious psyches um, and, and turn into monsters effectively. Um, and so he dedicated a lot of his of his work and of a lot of his um, um, sort of studies into understanding the the sort of how these things happen and and how to uh, how to uh, prevent them. Um, you know, it's it's kind of ironic because he was the, the sort of understanding of the unconscious psyche uh, was was flourishing at the time that Carl Jung was working, and so. Um, he had a good grasp of the of what he would call psychic um, uh, psychic phenomena, psychic group phenomena. Um, but at the same time, he was sort of powerless to stop the the events that led to these massive tragedies. Um, and so, and so, in an, in an in an effort to sort of prevent these things from happening, or at least contribute to their prevention, um, he would argue that we need to make these things conscious. We need to understand the deep roots of our sort of ideological biases um, in order to prevent them. That's sort of the key underlining theme throughout Jungian psychology is that we need to be conscious of what it is that that turns us into animals effectively. And by being conscious of it, we have some ability to act to the contrary. You know, we aren't just controlled by our, you know, our animal impulses. Um, we, we are able to do something about it. Right. So how does this integration of the shadow, how does it compare to spiritual awakening? Yeah, so the, the, the shadow is sort of one of, one of the big Jungian uh, concepts. Um, I like to, uh, there, there are some schools of Jungian thought that um, divide the shadow um, into a personal shadow and uh, a sort of an archetypal shadow. And the archetypal shadow is, is kind of just the archetype of the negative, of the, of the uh, antagonist. It's basically, we have, a, we have a function in our psyches that sort of looks out into the world and designate thing, designates things as either being familiar and unfamiliar. And the unfamiliar parts of the world, um, we sort of had this negative uh, pr- approach towards where we kind of reject it and we don't, we don't associate it with ourselves. Um, and so we have like a natural kind of antagonistic view towards it. Um, but the thing is we also do this to ourselves because as we, ha- as we develop an ego, we sort of associate certain ideas with this ego that are, you know, the things that are accepted by culture, um, the things that our parents teach us, you know, how to be. Um, and so certain things are 
a part of us or, or, or that, you know, we, we view as being a part of ourselves. Um, and then other traits we sort of reject and put into this category of not belonging to me. You know, uh, this, the, you know, if I'm the, your impotencies, you know, anything you regard as negative that is a part of your personality, you don't necessarily accept it as being a part of your personality. You sort of hide it and repress it and, and ignore it. Well, the, the problem with this is that um, this, all of these sort of shadow traits, as we could say, do belong to you and are, are a part of your psyche. So to reject them is fundamentally to reject a part of yourself. Right. Um, and that's, and that's, you know, that's, that kind of negates you being a sort of a complete person because you're ignoring a substantial part of what makes you a person. And so the integration of the shadow, what this refers to is the, the, act of identifying things which belong to you, which are a part of you, which you've rejected and learning to accept them and learning to live with them and finding ways to sort of cooperate with this, this shadow side of your personality. Right. That makes sense. But what about, is there a collective unconscious or collective shadow? Yeah. So, so the, 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 the terms collective unconscious um, and collective shadow, when we speak about the collective unconscious, what we're, what we're, essentially just talking about is the the sort of elements of the human psyche that are shared between all people. Um, we, another way to put this would be sort of the genomic psyche or the instinctive psyche. Um, and and sort of the collective, the word, what the word collective shadow um, often refers to is is sort of a society's um, tendency to, to um, sort of uh, draw certain characteristics into this shadow. Um, a, a whole society, for example, may regard, um, for example, if we, if we go back to Rome, Rome was a very proud society. Um, and so anything associated with weakness or, for example, men weren't allowed to show weakness at all or, you know, or uh, feel vulnerable. So all of that kind of stuff would be pushed into the shadow. And so it, that would be the sort of Roman collective shadow because it's the, the part of Roman society that right. you're not allowed to express. In uh, Nazi Germany, um, they identified I imagine they just identified deceptiveness as a Jewish thing and thus they didn't like that. Mm -hmm. that I suppose that's a similar sort of thing. Yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly it. It's, it's, it's the sort of traits that you just, um, that, that, like I said, uh, you don't want to associate with your culture. Right. And so, I mean, our modern culture has these as well, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you can, you can say they're kind of the flaws in our modern culture. Um, and every culture sort of differs to what it regards as negative. Um, and so different, different groups of people and throughout history would have kind of different shadows, would have different kind of personal shadows or collective shadows. Um, but again, all this results from the collective, the, the collective unconscious, the archetype of the collective unconscious of the shadow, um, which is that negative, which is that, um, that part of ourselves which wants to negate things and sort of view them as evil. Um, and and the big the big sort of concern with this and the big sort of danger with this at a collective level, you know, the, at the personal level, the shadow operates in one way, but at the collective level, the the massive danger is like you said in places like Nazi Germany, where this shadow becomes projected onto other people, right? Yeah. Where the inability to accept it as belonging to yourself inevitably leads to the consequence of of casting it off onto people and then blaming them for your problems and blaming them for sort of having the negative traits that keep society down and you know this this kind of ideology is used to justify any number of you know tragic evils yeah so it could be evils done against the group that are projected onto but i'm wondering if people are projected upon they might react negatively because they might not like that society projects on them. That's I. I would say that's yeah, that's definitely true to a certain extent. Um, it, it's one of the things I I've been thinking about recently is is um, is how when we you know when we when we assume that there is evil externally that the more evil it seems to make us. Um, I'll, br I'll bring up that Nazi Germany example again. Christianity, though, does a similar mm -hmm. thing with the idea of Satan being like the, the external cause of evil. Um, and mm -hmm. then you get people, that's why you might get nuns being very mean to like children or something. 
but because they see the evil as outside of themselves and aren't necessarily conscious of their own potential for dark. Yeah, behavior. yeah, I, I, I've seen that as well. I've seen that as well as in Christianity um, and other religions that sort of have these demonic figures and sort of blame these demonic figures for, um, for their evil, you know, instead of acknowledging the reality is that, you know, uh, this is kind of a debatable point but evil is in a sense subjective or at least relative. Evil is relative because different societies define evil by different metrics. And so, and, and so to, to sort of shuffle off what we consider evil onto other people is a very, you know, it's a very convenient way to escape evil and escape having to confront evil, um, however that, that's defined. But of course we can, we can sort of transform our picture of evil to make it more inclusive because you know, if we regard certain things as evil, but those certain things belong to us, you know, it's not necessarily that they're evil. You know, uh, one of the one of the big sources of evil, we could say, um, I'm using air quotes to, to say the word evil, but one of the things that, you know, are, you could argue makes us evil is sort of our evolutionary past. And I bring that up a lot, but um, just, just to make, but, and, you know, people sometimes think that's a bad thing that, you know, where we have this evolutionary past that this sort of animal psyche that exists within us. But I see it as more of like a, a, a human story of overcoming this evil that, and that we've gone so far from it. That's and important. it's sort of something to be proud of rather than being ashamed of. And so that, so that, that's how I sort of engage in a recontextualization of this evil and sort of make it see, make it appear what it actually is, which is a very complicated thing and not necessarily something which we should be ashamed of. Yeah. So what are the most interesting archetypes to you and why? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so there are a lot of sort of things which are considered archetypal, but we don't necessarily see them in the Jungian, in Jungian thought as being archetypes. You know, very simple things, in fact. Like So again, archetypes just refer to things which... Um, are sort of collective between all humans and sort of collective in the psyche. Um, so the body itself is kind of like an archetype. You know, our instinct to eat is kind of like an archetype, but those aren't the ones that Jung sort of focuses on. Right. Um, the one that I've been giving a lot of thought to, given the sort of culture we live in and the, and, um, the sort of political landscape that we live in, is the father archetype. Now, this isn't one that Jung focused a, a whole bunch on. He did have the term mana personality to describe something similar. Um, it, this is something that camp cup that's explored a lot more by his contemporaries, Eric Neumann and Anthony Stevens, Anthony Stevens right. being the more uh, recent one. Um, but essentially this archetype, this father archetype, you, you would think from the name that it has something to do with your personal father. And it does to a certain extent because your personal father is kind of the person who influences you when you're a kid. But essentially it refers to any sort of influence that you see as being superior to yourself that you kind of see as a role model. And so you model your behavior on this person because you see them as sort of like in a light sort of, in, you see them as, you know, as the sort of model of what it means to be a person. Um, and so that's how the archetype affects you at the personal level. But in a more general sense, we could see all sorts of leaders as sort of embodying this archetype um, all the way up to dictators where dictators sort of represent the dark side of this archetype. Um, Whereas Jordan sort of, Peterson is the positive side perhaps. Perhaps, yeah, perhaps. Um, and there are, there's a lot of sort of care figures that, 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 that can be used um, or sort of projected on or you project yeah. your sort of father archetype upon. Um, as role models. And it's funny that you mentioned Jordan Peterson because, because you know, a lot of people after hearing him and after being inspired by him and after, you know, learning so much from him and sort of having like a father figure who they didn't have before would kind of begin to sort of model their own behavior and their own sort of speech patterns and what they would say off Jordan Peterson. And that's exactly what, um, what Jung described as the man of personality, this sort of great individual who we base our behavior off of. But they're also leaders because you follow them. And, and mm -hmm. there's sort of a danger to this because you know, very charismatic leaders you know, they, they sort of possess our psyches the same, you know, this is why people become fanatically obsessed with, with certain politicians, Caesar, for example, himself, his followers were fanatically loyal, you know, and then in a sense, you could say that they were be being possessed by this archetype and seeing Caesar as sort of the father figure. Um, and they get energized in a sense by having such loyal following. Yeah, yeah, it's you know it's one of the trappings of power itself. It's like you 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 begin to think of yourself. You know, Caesar himself was deified, and it, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if he thought of himself as a god. But and, and you know, that's it's one of the big dangers of 
of sort of having a super inflated ego um, yeah. and, the tr- and the trappings of power. So what's the relationship between the left brain and right brain and the ego? Yeah, so this is, a, this is a, something that I've been giving a lot of thought to recently. Um, uh, so, the, so when we talk about the left and the right brain, what we're referring to is the fact that these two distinct hemispheres of the brain have different sort of approaches to reality. Um, and the metaphor that's, that I use to sort of get this, get this across is the fact that they're almost like two different people who exist inside your head. And it's kind of the fact that there's two different people and they're kind of tugging at each other and pulling against each other that causes there to be an ego in the first place. Um, And so when we think of the ego, what 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 we're mostly referring to is the left hemisphere of the brain, because that's the talking hemisphere. That's sort of where your inner monologue comes from. And that's sort of the annoying voice in your head or sometimes useful, you know, it, it, the voice in your head can vary in, in whether it's a positive thing or a negative thing. Uh, for example, if you, if you hear this voice all the time and it's just constantly pestering you, it could be a very negative thing, but at the same time, it can be kind of a directing influence. Um, and, so, um, and so that's mostly coming from the left hemisphere of the brain, but that, you know, y- y- the language has a very specific effect on our consciousness and um, it can't language, even though language is mostly contained in the left hemisphere. And when I'm speaking to you right now, it's mostly my left hemisphere that's speaking to you. Yeah. There's an influence of the right hemisphere, which kind of, which uh, the best way I can explain it is to say that the left hemisphere is responsible for the individual words that I'm saying, but the right hemisphere is responsible for sort of the, the my train of thought and sort the of concepts. keeping this all. Yeah, exactly. And sort of like the, the overall concepts and like the bigger sort of picture uh, we could say. And how that's related to the ego and your sort of self-concept is that the self-concept is a very big picture. It's a very big concept because you as a person sort of probably, um, when you think of yourself, for example, who who do you imagine, right? It's kind of like an entire character, an entire, um, you know, an entire set of ideas that belongs to you. Um, So, and so this, this kind of big picture is contained in the right hemisphere and it's always being referred to by the sort of talking ego in the left hemisphere. Um, And so the, the ego as an expression of your free will, as an expression of will in general is sort of in your left hemisphere, but the overall picture of yourself, of your self-concept greatly involves the right hemisphere as well. Okay. So the right hand hemisphere also is part of the ego makes up the ego or creates the ego yeah but the what Jung called the self is something else yeah so the self is kind of it's one of those concepts that I'm also kind of a little bit confused by (laughs) I'll be honest because it's it's a very it's a very uh sort of tough subject to handle but my understanding of it is that it the self is the entirety of your psyche so everything, including the ego, including all these archetypes, including the shadow, you know, the thing you reject, that's all a part of the self, the entirety of your psyche. Um, and, and sort of the way this, this archetype um, manifests, um, one of the sort of the symbolic manifestations of the archetype is of the union of opposites. Because when you think about something like the ego, the ego by definition, pulls itself away from the self because it's sort of like it's sort of like the self's represent representative on earth, um, but it's also kind of constructed by culture. So it's not really who you are. It's almost like a mask that you that um, exists in culture, um, and is um, conditioned by culture. But when we think about something like the union of opposites, the union of opposites um, uh, com- commonly refers to the union of the consciousness, the conscious ego and the unconscious. And it's sort of those bringing together and the acceptance of that totality, which constitutes the self archetype. Right, so it's a complete holistic psyche, I, s- I suppose. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, and that, that, hmm, that's right. But- that, and that would require a balance between masculine and feminine as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, especially since, you know, there, there is a sort of feminine side to the psyche. Um, but culture tends to emphasize, you know, if you're a man, it tends to emphasize your masculinity. But if you're a woman, it tends to mascul- emphasize your femininity. Um, all the while, these sort of contrasexual parts of your psyche 
um, are unexpressed and sort of don't and don't have any role in your in your psyche, but they exist there nonetheless. And so it's in sort of in order to be sort of a complete person and sort of to experience the totality of yourself, you need to experience the the feminine side if you're a man or the masculine side if you're a woman. Both these um, elements play roles in the psyche of both genders, and so they. Um, they're really important to to experience and to sort of utilize because they both have functions. They, you know, your conscious masculine ego is sort of your free will and sort of your desire and your ambition. But your but your feminine side, your feminine side is more empathetic, more emotional, and it's important for you to experience that. You know, there's a lot of men who don't experience their emotional side because that's sort of where life becomes enriched, and you sort of you know you feel um, you feel rather than just simply think. Um, and so that's why the union of these two poles is is also another symbol of the of the self archetype. Right, that's pretty interesting. Now, now decide what next. Uh, so, you've got an interesting video which is called "Bicameral Civilizations of Mesopotamia." So, what's what's a, what's that about? I'm glad you asked because I'm actually working on a new uh, bicameral video now. Um, but okay, so this is a this is a very interesting, cool theory um, for those who don't know about it, um, and it's one that invites a lot of you know a lot of skepticism, but also a lot of intriguing thoughts. and And the more I think about this theory, the more I sort of it it, it naturally invites it, itself to be believed because because the more it sort of fits into history and you see how it fits into history. Um, so I can roughly explain what the theory is, which is essentially, it has again to do with the, the two hemispheres of the brain um, and how they're kind of different and have two different personalities. Um, but what the, but what the bicameral mind is, is sort of a different, it's a different type of consciousness we could say than the one we experience today, which is which I call ego consciousness. So you can imagine you have this ego and it's, it's kind of your idea of yourself and you have it in your psyche and it's telling you what to do. It's telling you, okay, time to get up for work, time to go to work, time to do my work and then time to leave work. You know, it's, it's this voice that's telling you what to do. What the bicameral mind consciousness is, is that it's not your ego that's telling you what to do but rather what you perceive to be an external voice, like a God speaking to you. Okay, and like, in, you mean like Socrates. Yeah, because actually that's a good example because Socrates himself also experienced the daemon that, that spoke to him. And it, from his point of view, it felt like an external God. But if we, you know, if we bring it back to a psychological point of view, what this God actually is, according to the theory, is the right hemisphere of the brain attempting to communicate with the left in a using language in sort of this commanding way. Um, and, and, um, and it's this sort of state of consciousness, which was, which predates ego consciousness. And, um, and it's sort of responsible for the origin of civilization, at least according to the theory. Okay. Do you have mm -hmm. any um, issues with the theory? I do at certain points, um, especially in the way he's in. So this theory comes from the psychologist, Julian Jaynes. And there are some sort of points which um, are either are hard to believe or just plain untrue. Uh, for example, he proposes that consciousness emerged 1,000 years ago, or 1,000 BC, so two, so 3,000 years ago actually, um, which is kind of a very you know it's a very it's kind of it's not that clear and it's not you can't just put a date on something like that. So it what was before then? Before that, it was just the bicameral thing. Yeah, we, we got voices mm -hmm. we acted based on that, mm -hmm. that well, i don't that know what he bases it on i'm skeptical yeah yeah it's that's so there there are things about this theory that do invite skepticism um but and, and it, it, that kind of point especially with with the three thousand years ago that's that's kind of just it's too specific i think um also i'm not 100 percent sure whether it's accurate to say that everybody was in this state of mind um, perhaps some people, perhaps sort of like the prophets of society, perhaps like the shamanistic people um, in society, right. maybe they were like this, but it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of hard to say that everyone was like this. Well, um, speaking of hearing voices, let's mm -hmm. talk about shamanism. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and, and maybe it's connected to schizophrenia or, or maybe not, because like some people suggest, you know, in the spiritual awakening community that it's not, that not all schizophrenics are actually 
got something wrong with them really at all. Yeah, I, I actually agree with that. I totally agree with that. I don't think I don't think schizophrenia, you know, it's it's we regard it as dysfunctional today in today's society, but that's because everybody has a certain type of mind and we just expect everybody to be like us instead of accepting that there are sort of other types of consciousness out there and that they're, you know, you could you could have them and you're there's nothing necessarily wrong with them. Um, but what you what you mentioned just now about the sort of spiritual awakening. Um, there is evidence, and this goes in support of that of the bicameral mind theory, that these sort of voices that you hear do come from the right hemisphere of the brain, or at least are involved with the right hemisphere of the brain. And it's sort of that right hemisphere, which is very, it's very well established that this right hemisphere is responsible for sort of spiritual experiences and, and um, sort of mystical experiences, because unlike your left hemisphere, which is more, you could say, argue logical, you know, I don't like the, using the word logical because it kind of, it, it kind of, um, it isn't exactly accurate with regard to how the left hemisphere um, views the world. A, a better word might be exclusive, um, where right. it kind of, it's kind of self-referential. Though someone might be left brain heavy and view themselves as logical. And that yeah. might actually be a problem if, if they emphasize it too much. That's exactly right. And that's, just, you know, that's, that's, that's what happens a lot of the time is your, it's your assumption that you're super logical. That's actually caused by the left hemisphere viewing itself as logical that can sort of lead you into, uh, we could say errors in your thinking or that aren't or, logical. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, that aren't logical at all because you just, because you're just assuming sort of based on your past experiences, you know, in order to, in order to approach a difficult subject, you kind of need a degree of open-mindedness, mm -hmm. but if you don't have an open mind, which the left hemisphere by, by definition kind of doesn't have an open mind, you can't really uh, accept new information. And so, and, and again, it, it, you just think that you're being logical and being skeptical, but really you're just sort of being closed minded. Right, so what do you think shamanism is? So shamanism, for, shamanism, sorry, for me, um, I, think, I think the best sort of general definition is uh, when, when you enter a state of mind, where from your perspective, you're sort of experiencing a spiritual world, perhaps communicating with, with entities that seem to exist outside of you. Um, and you're gathering information from them, gathering insights from them. You're letting your ego dissolve, your conscious ego, which you know normally guides your life. You're letting that dissolve and letting that all die away to experience sort of the spiritual realm. Um, and if for those of you who don't like the term you know, spiritual realm, what's what's happening at us from a psychological point of view is that you're you're experiencing your unconscious mind which is very different from your conscious mind in the way it approaches the world it's, it's filled with sort of fantasy images and it's very um mystical and sort of its approach to to the world um and you're sort of allowing yourself to experience this because it's filled with ideas and and insights that are beyond the scope of consciousness you know it's it's the right, again, these, these things can all be traced back to the right hemisphere of the brain, but the, the right hemisphere, it's very good at connecting ideas. Um, one of the things which a lot of people who take psychedelics, um, one of the sort of consistent um, experiences they have is that they're able, better able to sort of connect different ideas and see the connections between things. And so they're able to think a lot more deeply about things. Well, this is all happening in the right hemisphere since the right hemisphere is more um, inclusive in its picture rather than exclusive like the left hemisphere. And so it's, it's experiencing this state of mind, which allows you to understand things um, significantly at a significantly deeper level, as well as to, it, it's, you know, the, the, the mystical experience, it's hard to articulate in words because you have to have the experience to know what it's like. It's very, it's very, um, it, just me talking about it doesn't really do it justice. Right. So um, what's the, so where does consciousness come from? That's a good question. Um, it's not one that's totally solved yet. Um, and it's, you know, there's a, there's a few different theories. The theory I favor has to do with language that consciousness, um, and by consciousness, I mean, well, the thing is the word consciousness kind of has different definitions. And one, the definition that I'm currently using is the, um, is the fact that you kind of have this focused mind that you can know things. For example, I'm sitting in my bedroom. I know that there's a bed behind me, but I don't have to look at it to know that, right? 
So um, that's, that's what I define as consciousness. And what this consciousness appears to be, what it seems to be, you know, I'm not 100% sure, it has to do with language and your mind sort of recreating a sort of uh, like a, a schematic of the world out there in your own mind. And it's sort of this schematic being imposed upon the world that is your conscious awareness. So like, for example, if I'm conscious of my hand right now, I have the idea of my hand in my, in my head, and then I can sort of impose that idea upon, you know, upon my, my actual hand in the real world. And sort of that's what, you know, that's what, um, that's what consciousness seemingly is, you know, it's not, a, it's not a definite answer, but it is the theory I sort of lean towards. Okay. So, um, do you believe there's a, a dramatic change in consciousness going on at the moment? Um, it's in some people perhaps, um, but I also see a dramatic sort of inability to change consciousness in some people because, um, you know, to change consciousness means, or, or, you know, Jung had a term called the transcendent function, which I'm currently studying, um, which explains how consciousness actually evolves and how it expands. And it's necessary to experience the unconscious and to sort of dive into the unconscious in order to experience an expansion of consciousness. Um, but of course, uh, um, you know, there are, it does seem like there's a, a, a percentage of the population that is experiencing their unconscious and allowing themselves to experience their, uncon their unconscious. Um, and there are a lot of ways in which experiencing the unconscious occurs. It occurs through dreams, which is sort of the default way, which happens automatically. But activities like, um, like deep meditation, um, various shamanistic practices, um, can also sort of induce this state wherein a person can experience their unconscious and, and expand their sort of their, their actual consciousness. Um, and, you know, there's a lot, there's sort of a new movement that's been, that's uh, seeking to explore the unconscious to a greater degree and, ex and they're experiencing this sort of expansion of consciousness. But I also see as kind of a counterpole to this, a great part of the population that refuses to sort of dive into their unconscious because to dive into your unconscious means to dissolve your ego and to dissolve your ego means to sort of throw away the assumptions that you've lived by um, in order for your ego to die but people in general aren't refuse are, are sort of aren't willing to let their egos die in the way that sort of produces this uh, response um um, because you, you know, you want to hold on to your beliefs. You want to hold on to the things that you've known your entire life. You don't want to just throw that away. But of course, um, ego death isn't like a permanent thing. It's just a, it's more a rebirth of your ego, right? A yeah. change in, yeah, so I suppose. So what's the metaphysics of the psyche? So um, this is a this is sort of a, a topic that I'm very passionate about um, because it, it allows you to re sort of re -under, understand what the psyche actually is. Well, actually, it doesn't explain what the psyche is um, because that question is still you know we don't know have an exact answer. There are a lot of theories, but we don't know. But when you understand that you have a psyche, you begin to perceive the world completely differently because. You know, the, the natural assumption is, is that when you look at the world and your, your eyes are, you know, looking at different, for example, I'm in my room right now, I'm looking at different things in my room, you assume that those things are, are as they appear to be. You don't assume that your psyche or your mind is sort of filtering things about the world or changing things about the world. You just assume that you see reality as it actually is. But you don't actually see reality as it is. You only experience your own psyche, your own sort of experience, your own sort of subjective experience of things. And, and the, you know, the thing that's very mind-blowing about this is that we have no idea what the psyche is. We just know that it exists. And we know that it's the first thing that exists. You know, you don't experience the universe. You experience your own mind and your own mind sort of creates a, a, a version of the universe which you experience. But you don't know to what extent your mind is leaving certain things out. Maybe there are different dimensions here that I can't see that your mind is just naturally filtering out because it doesn't, you know, it has no need to perceive those things. Um, and that's sort of, um, and when we think about even, even simpler phenomenon, like uh, the one I always bring up is color. You know, we don't actually know what color is. You know, you could probably hear a scientist explain it to you. Well, color is a, is a certain wavelength of light and a different wavelength is a different color. But, you know, we know about wavelengths of light, but we don't know how that actually connects to the conscious experience of color. 
why is one wavelength this color and then a different wavelength is green while one wavelength is orange? Why is that the case? And what's the connection between those two things? We, you know, there's no evidence that color exists apart from our own minds. We can't actually prove that that the that the wall is white or that the you know the sun is whatever color it is. We can't prove that. All we can say is that my mind experiences it as, as such. But like if you imagine like the the mind of an alien, for example, that evolved on a different planet, there's no reason to think that that alien would see, see look at the sun or look at an object or look at a red object and see it the same way we do. It might experience a different color or it might not experience color at all. It might just perceive it in a way perceive it in a way, excuse me, that um that we can't even fathom. And so that sort of lends sort of the idea that the psyche exists and that it is a real thing. Um, but you know, for most of history, we haven't acknowledged this fact. We just assume that we perceive the world as it actually is. They might they might perceive like the sun as having a psyche. Yeah, exactly. You know, you, the, they could perceive the world in a completely different way from us. And it's not like we can say that they're wrong because that's just how they perceive it. Right. I suppose it it takes a certain open mind to stop viewing some people as right and some people as wrong. And even if you stop seeing it that way, like sometimes it sneaks up on you, right? Yeah, I, I'm. I you know I try to try to sort of take this inclusive view where different sort of perspectives can have legitimacy, but you know at the same time the natural tendency is to just disregard other people's experiences. Um, but again, you can. What I try to do in my personal life is acknowledge when that happens, when I do that, and and sort of correct and sort of acknowledge my own biases. Yeah, I, I feel like that helps. I've been doing something similar. Mm. So you mentioned Nietzsche in at least one of your videos, and there's a lot he talks about. So um, what do you think his key ideas are and why are they important? Yeah, um, so... I'm interested mostly in the psychological aspects of his of his philosophy. He he did claim to be sort of a, a psychological philosopher, where his main sort of um, critique and main sort of um, inquiry um, was the mind itself, uh, to sort of help people identify um, sort of the natural tendencies of their mind, which they aren't in control of. Um, but of course, his philosophy expands a sort of broader range than that. Um, one, one idea that I think is central to all his works, it appears in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, and it appears, you know, as a main theme throughout all of his books, is the idea of the Superman, which to him was, I could put it in a Jungian way, which would be sort of the most individuated person um, possible, like the most, the most um, sort of um, they, they, they define themselves on their own terms. They don't let society dictate who they are. They are who they decide to be. And they don't base you know, their values on the collective values. They determine for themselves what they value and, and why they believe so. And then they pursue that to the, to the extent that it is possible. Um, very interesting idea for a lot of reasons. I think the archetypal, for example, the viewing the sort of Superman as the archetype um, the archetype of like the great individual, the hero, so to speak, who sort of beats, you know, the, the, the restrictions imposed upon him by society. I think that's an interesting way to view it. Um, but it also is sort of a practical thing um, because a lot of, Jung traced a lot of mental suffering to the inability to individuate yourself from the collective because there are things that make you different, idiosyncrasies that make you different from the collective, that make you, um, you know, don't necessarily match with what other people expect of you. And, but even the, but if you try to force yourself to live in accordance with that, there's going to be a mismatch between your psyche and sort of reality. And so Jung's sort of method to, to help people with this problem would be to, to identify what makes you different, accept what makes you different and sort of allow yourself to, to know what, what makes you different from the collective and, and be okay with that. Um, I kind of, I kind of went off topic there because we were talking about That's Nietzsche fine. and then I started talking about Jung. Tangents um, are actually helpful uh, up to point <laughs> yeah yeah um i'm notorious for tangents my my adhd brain just kind of goes on all sorts of different directions but well, i've also been diagnosed with it so i understand yeah <laughs> yeah um but it makes for good conversation <laughs> yeah so so nietzsche's idea of the superman i'm into i'm into the idea of 
that we're going through a spiritual awakening to another dimension or density of consciousness, right? Mm-hmm. And what, what do you mean by that exactly? Because I've, I've heard that idea a lot, but I've never sort of delved into it. Oh, I don't know where to start. Um, <laughs> I mean, so it's, so it's about that there's different levels of consciousness and the, for example, there's like objects that think of it in the like, you know, um, Shinto has this idea that there's spirits attached to objects. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit like you get that with like objects, and the animals have a soul as well. And basically, you this reincarnation, and the idea is that you incarnate on different levels as you evolve and learn and grow as a soul through many lifetimes. And that uh, you go, you go in after being an animal successfully, essentially, you, you become a human. And after that, you essentially ascend and you live out the next stage, which is the idea is that if we can't see, if we can only see a certain aspect of reality, there's more uh, frequencies and so forth that exist in reality that we perceive in our regular three dimensional perception that when we ascend we we get a wider perception and a wider range of abilities and for example uh, many aliens would be actually ascended relative to us Mm -hmm. and uh, humanity a lot there, there are people who believe that humanity is undergoing a great transformation now which is around the time of 2000 and 12 according to the main calendar and according to according to the hopi and like a number of different like native native cultures who've got this idea that there's a new age it's a new age movement essentially right Mm -hmm. and there's different forms of it but the idea is we're moving into that it's just happening now. And it's the idea is partly that it gets darkest before the dawn. You know the dark night of the soul? Yeah. Well, imagine if you take that on a collective level across all of humanity. Well, in that case, it wouldn't be surprising that the 20th century and also the, 19th, uh, the 21st is becoming so, well, there's so much darkness in a sense. The idea would be that because we need to clear this negativity and it also there are people like psychopaths for example and sociopaths who might be they might embrace the dark sides of humanity entirely and uh we need to well in order to us so this is things are going to get have to get worse before they can get better that's the idea just like when people are individuating mm-hmm. what are they wider scale and i suppose it must have something to do with the individuation or the the individual individuation process (laughs) (laughs) or integration of the shadow Uh, Mm -hmm. i imagine that has probably has a connection to how you awaken yeah i can definitely see that yeah i mean i mean you're open-minded right so it's very at the very least it's worth exploring it because i think it might have a connection or an overlap with some of the themes that you talk about in your yeah no it it definitely does and it is it's interesting all that you were saying it it actually i I definitely i could see the connection and i can even i can even tell you a bit about the connection where where yeah the superman for example it's just like well that would be the next level for us right because it's Mm -hmm. described by nietzsche as as much different as much as we are different from monkeys it, it, the superman is different from us mm-hmm. i mean yeah that yeah that's yeah so what were you saying yeah no that there's there's a whole bunch there to seize upon um that, that i think that i think um you know a lot of that actually is sort of the reason i was i want to discuss Jungian psychology because Jung himself sort of noted these periods uh i'm not sure how much because it's like you said like things get worse before they get better and i don't like to be a pessimist 
but I do see things today going to sort of a bad place, but I see sort of this chaotic state as being the, the birthplace of something new and something better than what we presently have, you know, and there's, you know, there's like that, it's like that in history. Um, the crude example that I kind of give is that after World War II, which was sort of the most destructive event that humans ever sort of inflicted upon themselves, you know, the world in a lot of ways, not every way, De definitely, but in a lot of ways became a lot better after this terrible period because we realized, okay, we don't want anything like this ever to happen again. So let's try to cooperate rather than fight, you know, and that's, and then, and then something better sort of emerged from this chaos. And so, you know, things can get terrible and things can get bad, but it seems fundamentally that, that something better emerges. It's like, it's, um, Something, something that's higher and 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 more evolved and 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 sort of just better and and leads to a better life emerges from the sort of chaos that that occurred in the past, um, and I, I kind of see that as being connected to what you were saying. Another thing that I wanted that that I thought you said was really interesting was sort of how how mankind sort of evolves and sort of evolves consciously and intellectually and keeps going into these sort of higher stages. I think as well, sort of. A spiritual awakening um, kind of leads to that, and and leads to the the evolution of our consciousness, and leads to um, at a, even at a collective level, leads to our sort of our deepening our relationship with the universe. One could say, um, and and sort of becoming more connected to it, but at the same time, kind of more individuated from the universe. You know, we're not as these as you know having these human bodies. We're not just particles and molecules we're like these spiritual beings almost um and so in a sense we're kind of we're kind of growing away from the universe but at the same time being more connected to it i don't know if that's if that makes sense <laughs> but that's kind of that's kind of where my train of thought is leading i'm not sure if it's away but maybe maybe it transcends away and towards <laughs> unification of opposites right mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's it, you, oh, another way to sort of phrase it maybe is that is that we we sort of become more connected and then we individuate and then we become more connected you know that, and that's the cycle of the individual as well is that um you know you're you, well, i mentioned ego death before but ego death isn't just one thing that happens to you once nor is it something that's permanently ha that permanently happens to you it's sort of a cycle you your ego dies and then you sort of become reborn as a new individual and then later in your life it happens again and then you become reborn as a new individual and it's sort of this continuous process but it's not just a process at your own, in your own life it's a process that occurs throughout sort of the course of civilization um but one thing that i will add is that even though i've painted kind of a rosy picture um sort of sort of trying to say that the chaos that occurred in the past will inevitably lead to good. I don't believe that it is inevitable. I do believe that it's possible that civilization can reach a chaotic state and then never recover. Um, this happened kind before. Of a... Pardon? This happened before. Uh, so like, well, such as- uh, A civilization collapsing, like, well, Rome, for example. Well, yeah, well, yeah, but uh, what I mean is that, um, like, even if Rome collapses, um, sort of the civilizations that replace Rome can kind of build upon what they did and sort of learn from You mean like insights. nuclear war or something? Something like that, um, you know, where where the sort of progress that we've made spiritually and intellectually and scientifically doesn't carry on to the next generation. But of course, that's, you know, that's a pessimistic thing to say. And I don't, I'm kind of, you know, these, I, these are just sort of my thoughts, but I don't know which of these is true. Does, is progress inevitable or is it possible that everything, you know, goes to shit? <laughs> like, it's not, it's not clear... I'm not personally convinced that either of these is apparent, if you know what I mean. Right. We just have to see how it goes, really. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's one of those sucky things. Like, I, I love the human story. I love seeing where we've come from and where we've where we're going. But at the same time, I hate being a part of the human story because I'm in the midst of this. <laughs> I wish I could just watch it like a movie or something. Well, you know, there's definitely definitely advantages to being human. Um I mean, there's a reason why we're here. So you mentioned World War One and World War Two were these key events, and how there's this, there was this you could definitely see how the shadow and the psyche was um, ended up being directed in or moving in negative ways mm -hmm. that were reflection of projection and all this. But did you believe that perhaps? this can and has been manipulated by 
um, by those, well, perhaps you could call them elites. And maybe there's an archetypal link there as well. Yeah, the, yes, um, definitely. That sort of, so again, shadow projection is a very natural tendency, but a person like Hitler or somebody could, can, you know, is, I'm not sure if he was conscious of shadow projection, but he definitely utilized it. He definitely, you know, played into people's natural prejudice towards, you know, in that case, minorities, um, and, and sort of, and, and sort of manipulated them by sort of using their archetypal energy, so to speak, um, to direct them and, you know, cause them to do his terrible bidding. Um, and so, yeah, the people in power can manipulate or tend to manipulate. It's not even, it's not even a, an ability. It's just that they, this tends to happen, but they tend to manipulate people's sort of unconscious psychology. And that's sort of the big danger with these, with charismatic leaders and, and people who, who are great at giving speeches is that without really any substance is that they can say really simple things that appeal to people because it's affecting their sort of archetypal psychology. That's one of the big biases of the archetypes is that they're so, they seize upon our mentality so sort of so completely that we're kind of powerless against them. And so when you have somebody like some, you know, when you have elites that just sort of tap into your archetypes and sort of tap into the unconscious structure of the mind, they can manipulate people, you know, to do anything, to do any, to do any terrible things any number of terrible things because, you know, a civilization like Germany at the time was considered a modern civilization. How did they become so barbaric? Well, part of the right. answer, you know, there's a lot of sociological, sociological explanations having to do with the state of Germany at the time. But at a psychological level, at a fundamental psychological level, you can, Hitler just played into their, into people's tendency to project their shadows outwards rather than accept the darkness inside. And, and he was able to manipulate that human tendency and, and, you know, to, and it led to a disastrous, um, to disastrous consequences. Right. So, um, I, if I recall correctly, Jung argued that Germany more so than the rest of the West at the time repressed things. Um, and that they, um, and that, my way, my interpretation of this is that by by the modern day, perhaps this level of repression is actually spread like and intensified across the whole of the West, and it, that suggests something very worrying. If the the state of white of the Weimar Republic psychologically is the state of you know, through globalization, if if that's the state of the world psychologically, that 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 might explain things. Yeah, it it is it is worrying, um, and it is, you know, I as I I'd like to think that my you know my work and your work as well, um, sort of sort of are preparing us or sort of warning us about these consequences. Um, because it's so widespread, and anybody who sort of who who sort of observes the world properly can see. Um, not even necessarily the same thing happening. It's see sort of where where things are going, um, and I'm you know it's it is kind of depressing, but at the same time I am hopeful. I'd say um, that overall things will be okay, even though even though we may have to face a tumultuous period, and you know things are not things are not going you know as well as they could be. I am hopeful that things will in the end turn out okay. Yeah. That same. So you mentioned we well, mentioned ancient Egypt and mm-hmm. Ka, but interestingly, Ka is part of Katabasis, which you wrote as well. Descent into the underground, under descent into the underworld. So is that yeah. true? Is that those are connected? No, it just looks like that to me. That's a, something my intuition is telling me. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. That I, I I see a connection, but I, um between those two things, definitely. What was your question? Sorry. <laughs> All right. So right, what can you tell me about uh, Ka, uh, the ancient, in ancient Egypt? So the, from my understanding, um, my understanding is based more on how Jane's, the Julian Jane's, the bicameral mind guy, how he explained it. Um, but of course, Egyptologists are kind of, kind of maybe have a slightly different opinion. Excuse me. But um, from my understanding, it, sorry, um, is 
the ka can be sort of understood as the spiritual element of a person. So from the Egyptian point of view, a person isn't composed of a single entity, as we often think of today. There were different sort of entities and different sort of spiritual aspects that composed a person. A person's body was one and a person's ka was the other. And this ka um, doesn't die and it, it doesn't really, it can't be destroyed in a sense. Once your body die, your, dies, your ka still exists and it's still, in fact, what the ancient Egyptians believed is that, you know, it's, it's similar to a, just a, like a regular spirit in today's sort of in Christianity, soul. for example, or like a soul. Yeah, exactly. In a lot of different religions. It would, it, in fact, it, I would say it is synonymous with the word soul. Um, but what's, you know, another thing I can mention quickly is the, is that James believed that um, as Egypt evolved as a culture, and again, this is relates to the bicameral mind, people didn't think that they were hearing God. They thought that they were hearing their own cause and their call would be kind of like the spiritual messenger um, on behalf of the person. So like, like your higher self. Yep, yeah, that's exactly right. It would be it would be your higher self, and um, and it would also have a function where it would the call would be required to go to speak with the gods in heaven or you know the Egyptian afterlife, um, and then come back and then tell the person you know what to do um, or you know essentially essentially what um, you know it, it could tell them any number of things because again how this does it call, do this? So, you know, there's a, if I, if we speak of the psychological mechanism, it would be the same thing that I, that I described with the bicameral mind and the same thing with the right hemisphere. The ka would actually be a person's right hemisphere. Um, and then the sort of, maybe their... I've got a different interpret where the higher self, mm -hmm. I've got an interpretation, but perhaps, oh man, I just lost it. So the, the higher self is supposed to be you in the future, <laughs> according to the new age movement anyway the higher self uh, is you well, well uh, yeah like, sorry, like go ahead. when you're like way more ascended like just before you become one with the source of creation uh and you send back messages to you pre in previous lives uh back that's in time. that's super interesting that's that uh, well again when we the a lot of these things it, it's 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 hard for me to even articulate because I I definitely agree with you, or at least I, I could see how how that would be the case, um, um, but also um, it's it's kind of complicated because because when we think for example, like if a, a casual reader of Julian Jaynes would say okay these gods don't actually exist because you know you know gods don't actually exist they're just in your head. But there is kind of an existence there because remember that I mentioned before the metaphysics of the psyche. Well, if the psyche is real, because it definitely is, I'm experiencing it right now, and I hear the voice of God, that voice of God is kind of real. Like you can't it's just say something. it's an illusion. Yeah, exactly. It's something, right? And I don't know what that something is in its finality, like what it is fundamentally. But I think that your the theory that you mentioned or the idea that you mentioned could be sort of the answer to that. That it could be linked in with synchronicity as well. Because mm -hmm. Jung talked about synchronicity and about how it's um, a meaningful coincidence. Essentially, there's a causation there, even though it seems like a coincidence. Yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. And and. Um... They could definitely be linked into synchronicity. I'm interesting. I'm interested in that idea that you mentioned before, um, that um, that you're sort of spiritual. So when you speak about your higher self, that also means that your lives in the future. So for example, I'm a human. Yeah, right but your now. your future lives might change depending on your present life, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I was gonna. I was actually gonna ask that because, like, what if if it's your future trying to speak back to you? Wouldn't that be evolving? But again, I could also conceive of that being possible, which is very hard to understand from a human perspective you know and like um there's, there's, there's one other thing you know i've I, i've explored a lot of these ideas before when i was um sort of getting into spirituality and one of the things i've you know i one idea that i came across and explored to a great extent i don't really talk about it now but i probably will in the future is how you know the idea of the simulation hypothesis this is kind of a big tangent yeah but the idea of the simulation may just be what spirituality has been explaining from sort of a different perspective yeah mysticism where... is a sort of simulation theory it's just right. a spiritual simulation theory rather than a technological one and is there really much of a difference 
Yeah, exactly. I don't see I don't see technological as being distinct and different from spiritual. I do see these things as being interconnected. I can even, you know, I've I even argue that spirituality is the mechanism by which new technologies occur because you know, that humans develop them. We may think differently. We, we may think, innovation no, and the, the creativity. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's what I mean. Um, that your innovation and, and your, the sort of creative part of your mind, that's kind of, a, it is kind of like a spiritual experience, but decontextualized from being spiritual. Being in the flow, for example. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, You've mentioned uh, games like Dark Souls, but perhaps being on Earth is kind of a game for a soul, in a sense. Yeah, that, that maybe that's what this is. Maybe this is some kind of a video game. But but here's the thing: it's not just like because when in our modern day we kind of just view video games as novelties, like this is just something you do for fun. But maybe like a highly advanced civilization in the future doesn't view video games that way. It views video games as a more of a spiritual experience where, where it's almost like this is, it's hard to, it's hard for me to articulate, but like maybe a video game isn't just something you do for fun. It is something you do to improve yourself and to, yeah. to sort of experience the universe in different, from different perspectives. Oh yeah. Like for example, um, in the new age movement, it said that for example, a rapist might get raped in the next life. So they experience what it's like. Right, justice, so to speak. Well, more like maybe I suppose the term would be karma, so that you karma, yeah. And I suppose, I mean, it's kind of really interesting because apparently, uh, apparently, you, there are beings, spiritual beings, that enact karma, like by making bad things happen to you if you've done bad things. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's kind of like a law of the universe almost that's done rather than like justice. Because I mean, to me, I mean, while retributive justice does appeal to people, it feels a bit, the idea of revenge being justice is just a bit yeah. off to me. Yeah, I agree. But karma agree. isn't the same thing as that, I don't think. No, because again, it's like, I think, I think, I don't know. I don't know if this is definitely connected, but if, if you, if the sort of, if the spirit of the, if the journey of the soul is to sort of go through these iterations of, of life and become higher and higher and ascend, so to speak, your sort of final iteration will be this improved version that kind of looks upon everything that happened in the past and is kind of shaped by it and kind of transcends it so that, and kind of sees you know what I mean? Like it sees the sort of flaws in the past and it kind of grows from them. So it's not just, it's not just about justice. It's about evolving, so to speak, and, and becoming, becoming more moral or maybe more spiritual. I don't know what the exact word would be, but, but yeah. So what is katabasis? Yeah, so uh, katabasis is a Greek term which refers to, well, it, it, in ancient Greece, it definitely referred to something different. But today, a lot of um, scholars use it to describe a theme in in mythology and stories of a descent into the underworld. Um, the underworld being a symbol of many different things, but the sort of psychological interpretation would be your unconscious. But of course, it doesn't necessarily have to be the unconscious. It could also be something in reality where you have to confront um, sort of the underworld, the, the place you don't want to go, the 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 place that Shadow you're afraid realm. to. Shadow, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of different. There's a lot of different sort of uh, terms to describe it, and a lot of different symbols that ultimately mean the same thing. Um, Jung even connected um, the sort of belly of the whale as being a similar symbol. Um, but but what it, you know in psychological terms what this refers to is a is a you know a, a plunge into your own unconscious mind um, willingly or unwillingly because some, you know sometimes this happens unwillingly in fact um, Jung said that schizophrenia would be classified as sort of when a person unwillingly experiences their own unconscious um, and of course this journey into the unconscious can be undertaken for many different reasons. Um, with the effect of ultimately resulting in a, in a psychological transformation, a lasting psychological transformation 
uh, gained from this sort of plunge into the underworld. Right. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So there's also one thing you mentioned, this is I'm sure a very rich thing, but uh, <laughs> is the um, Bhagavad Gita, that's the um, Hindu or Vedic text. Mm-hmm, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, so, uh, yeah, go ahead. I mean, yeah, well, what do you, what do you want to share about what it teaches us? There's, you know, it's a really, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not even a very long text, but every sort of, every sort of statement carries so much meaning. So it's hard to even just to say just a few things about it. Um, but I found it interesting for when I was actually exploring the sort of idea about the simulation and how that's connected to spirituality. A lot of the things that, that are spoken seem to resonate well with that. Um, and there's so many different angles to approach the book, even, even this sort of bicameral theory. Who is Krishna in relation to Arjuna? Um, you know, is that a bicameral experience? I would say it has to be, you know, in a sense. Because again, the, the, when the bicameral experience isn't just about hearing the voice of God. It's also about, like the, from the Jungian's perspective, uh, communicating with the unconscious mind. So you can approach from that, from that um, angle. But I think the value of the Gita comes from its words and what it says and how to sort of proceed through life. And that there's sort of different paths, um, different dharmas that you can sort of approach life by. Um, and and it, it's it's a very peaceful sort of reassuring work to experience because in one sense it's like there's a duty you need to fulfill your duty but at the other at the other end it's like it's okay if you fail in your duty there are no sort of expectations but there is also a kind of a spiritual quest where you sh- there is a good reason to fulfill your expectations for example a, 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 like a like a like a hero who needs to do something difficult. And this could be applied in, in a story, but it could also be in real life. For example, during a, a war where, you know, you need to defend your homeland or something, you know, something like that, where it's very, very scary to have to confront this enemy and it's very demoralizing, but there's a spiritual reason for why you should do it. But at the same time, it's okay if, you, if it doesn't go the way you expected it. The universe kind of has this self-correcting ability anyways. Um, and a lot of a lot of different themes uh, appear in this book from reincarnation. He explains, Krishna explains, for example, that um, you know you the the soul can never die. It always it it has always existed. There was never a point where it came into being. It has always existed, which is kind of a mind boggling thing to even ponder because how could something always exist? You know, we are, normally we think of things as kind of having an origin, but in this case, apparently, it doesn't have an origin. It just kind of you know, always existed the soul. So it can never die. It can never be singed with the, with the, with the flame. It can never be pierced with the sword and it reincarnates. And so your body or like your body can be thought of as clothing that you wear and the soul discards these clothings and puts on new, puts on new clothes. Um, and those are different lives, different bodies. Um, and, and, um, and yeah, so it's a very rich text, and it and it goes through a lot of philosophy um, that I can't even you know you have to read it yourself to really d- dig into it. You know the, right. the dialogue between Arjuna and Krishna is is very interesting, and it, and it it's kind of like an all encompassing you know s- statement about life itself. Okay, um, you mentioned a whole range of archetypes that we haven't gone into yet. For example, dragons. Mm-hmm. So what's the significance of dragons? Yeah, glad, glad you mentioned that. That's, that's, that's one of my favorite things to discuss. I, I'm obsessed with dragons. Um, and there's a couple, you know, archetypes and archetypal images are, are not, you know, the reason they, we, we even discuss archetypes in the first place is because they're kind of hard to grasp. You know, it's not, it's not like the dragon, okay, the dragon represents this. It's not, it's not as simple as that. The dragon represents sort of a collection of ideas that are connected to each other, but can be applied in different ways. And that's true with all archetypes. Um, all archetypes are very big ideas. They're not just these simple, you know, one note, one note concepts. Um, so the dragon 
again, like there's a multiplicity of interpretations, but the, the path I like to take it, take it on is that the fight with the dragon signifies a battle between consciousness, the conscious ego and the unconscious. Um, and, you know, normally we don't want to talk about fighting the unconscious because you want to accept the unconscious. But what if the unconscious kind of is overpowering the ego? What if it's kind of, you know, your bad tendencies and your bad impulses are kind of overpowering your moral, your kind of higher moral intentions? Because as much as we like to think of the ego as something that's, that needs, that's bad, that needs to be sort of conditioned, the unconscious can also be this kind of unruly destructive force. And so the key thing in Jungian thought is balance between consciousness and unconscious, not to favor one side or the other, to balance them and sort of unify them so that neither of them overpowers the other. And what this dragon symbol is, uh, one way to, uh, so the, the fact that it appears as a dragon and a, as a snake and a sort of this reptilian thing um, plays into sort of the human, human uh, biological evolution where it seems that um, when we were primates, when we were living in trees, we evolved a mechanism to be able to identify snakes and, and sort of um, a natural fear of snakes to be able to um, avoid them. Um, and that actually, that's actually a theory that has to do that that explains uh, why our eyes are so sharply focused because it might be it might be because we need to um, we need to avoid seeing snakes that's why our eyes are so good at focusing on, in on things um, and so when we when we see things like a dragon a dragon is just kind of like a big snake you know with wings. different dragons with wings with breathe fire right um, which is actually represents an evolution of the dragon theme because whatever if it has wings what does that mean if it breathes fire what does that mean you and know, symbolically very, what does that mean yeah well so yeah so <laughs> symbolically the dragon is kind of this this unruly part of our psyches that's very animalistic that's very reptilian that's very cold very selfish to an extent very lazy even like psychopathic yeah kind yeah. of psychopathic but also kind of you know it, it, when we, th we you know the word psychopathic is interesting because you know, are animals psychopathic? Because animals normally, in most circumstances, are very selfish and very, you know, they're they're concerned with their own survival. Um, but that today in the modern society is is kind of, um, you know, kind of pathological and kind they of They do care for offspring, though, or at least the mother might. Well, it depends on the species. But That's true. That's true. That's very true. Um, so it's not, you know, animals are also very complicated. And so not... Um, you know, not something we can easily categorize. Um, but again, there is this sort of reptilian side to ourselves. And it's, um, it's very old. Brain, right? The reptile brain, right, yeah. And it's very old and it's very, it's not conscious, so to speak. It's, it's, like, it's like a crocodile. It's like a, it's a very cold being. You know, and I love crocodiles and I love reptiles. I, at one point I wanted to be a herptologist, which is a person who studies reptiles. But I also see them as sort of a useful symbol for explaining this sort of this unruly part of our psyches that if the ego can control it, it can gain power over it. And the example I always bring up is like practicing an instrument. If I take, a, if I take my guitar, for example, and I try to practice it, there's going to be this natural resistance, this natural urge to not do it because, you know, you know, the unconscious psyche would rather be doing other things, would be rather, you know, seeking pleasure, for example. Um, but if you can get this part of you under control and sort of tame it and fight against it, it becomes something that serves you rather than hinders you. Um, and one myth that I can bring up, um, there's a lot of really cool myths that, ex that explore this idea. Like being a dragon rider. Yeah, like, like, like being a dragon rider or something like that. For example, you know that movie, um, How to Train Your Dragon? Oh, um, yeah, that's great. Yeah, we can, we can think of that even as having an archetypal meaning, you know. Um, because it's sort of an evolution of what the dragon means. It's like, now you need to train your dragon. Uh, but the more ancient symbol that appears is that is the symbol of the horse. Because the horse is kind of like this animal unconscious being, but it's not like an enemy. It's like something that you control. When, when you ride a horse, you direct where it goes. And sort of this kind of becomes a metaphor for your conscious ego in relation to your unconscious psyche. You kind of have to treat your unconscious psyche like an untamed horse that you need to sort of tame and cooperate with. And if you do so, it'll serve you immensely. Um, and uh, I was mentioning a myth. One of the myths that, that is symbolic of this is the myth of Pegasus. Um, because, right, because Medusa, who's also a snake-like being and sort of represents this reptile side, um, and it's closely associated with femininity, yeah. uh, interestingly enough. Um, 
once Perseus slays uh, Medusa, from her blood arises Pegasus. And that's an interesting symbol, because what does that mean? Well, again, what that means is if you can sort of fight against this reptile side, the animal within becomes not this evil thing, but becomes a part of you and becomes um, something that serves you. So the negative feminine animalistic side becomes a positive animalistic feminine. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's, 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 um, um, that, that uh, is represented by the sort of rescue of the princess from the dragon. Um, another archetypal theme, which is sort of the transformation of this of this feminine thing into something positive. Um, but you know, the princess itself is because again, this unconscious psyche, excuse me, this unconscious psyche is not a bad is not a necessarily a bad thing. And in fact, it has a function. And the anima itself, and I, I think we'll probably be dis discussing that a bit after, but the anima itself has a function of allowing a person to enter their unconscious psyche because, you know, masculinity is associated with consciousness and, you know, directing your conscious psyche and, you know, overpowering this bad guy. But at the same time, you need to be able to experience the feminine side um, of the unconscious and, and sort of reap its benefits. So... There's the anima and the animus, the syzygy, I think. I'm not sure how it's pronounced, but that's, so that's right. How do you explain that to the listener? So the syzygy. So um, again, another big Jungian topic, um, but it has to do with the pole of masculine and feminine. The syzygy refers to the polarity between masculine and feminine. Um, and how would I explain this is essentially if you're a man, you know, there's the, the you know, bare bones explanation is if you're a man, you have a sort of feminine side that's kind of um, doesn't have as much energy as your masculine side, because if you're a man, it's the masculine side that's emphasized. But you do have this feminine portion of yourself, which uh, doesn't usually come out um, unless it's projected or unless it sort of overpowers you. And the same thing is true of women. Women having this feminine side is predominant. The feminine side of a woman is predominant in most cases. You know, there are exceptions. Um, and they're very, you know, the, the exceptions are, the exceptions actually prove the rule um, because it shows that sort of the, the feminine side of a person can, uh, a fem the feminine side of a man can almost act in a possessive way. Um, but what, what, I, what I was saying was that the, uh, the masculine side of a woman is referred to as, an, as the animus and the feminine side of a man is referred to as the anima. And again, these two things have different functions and um, it's important to, uh, to give sort of equal weight to both of them, not equal weight necessary, but give their necessary weight to each of them, because the feminine side of a man, you know, is responsible for his empathy. It's responsible for his emotionality. Whereas the masculine side of a woman is responsible for her, her ambition, her self-determination. Um, you know, when a woman is, is be, feels like she's being controlled by other people, it's the masculine side that says no. That kind of you know fights against that, and um, both of these things, although they can be positive, also have a negative pole. Actually, before I mention the negative pole, the the, the important thing, another important thing is the sort of uh, biology of it, which is that the reason you have this feminine side, um, if you're a man, is to be able to project it onto women in order to find sort of your ideal partner. Generally speaking, we seek a partner who who is like us in some way, but you know, but opposite because they're feminine. So all of these feminine traits we project outwards and, um, and um, that sort of allows us to select a, a partner who we think is compatible with us. But again, this can exert a seriously possessive influence over a person. We all know what it's like to have a crush, um, but we also, you know, sometimes know what it's like to be obsessed and infatuated. And this is this negative side of the anima sort of not being able to, to disengage from a person. Um, but it's also responsible for our passionate sense of love when we really love somebody who we are compatible with and and who we are vibing with. That that sort of sense of um, of love does come from this um, from the syzygy as well. Right. So politically, could you link? Would you link any movements with the anima and the animus? Yeah, um, it's, it's, um, so, you know, today, in today's society, there is a trend, and it's very observable to the keen observer, 
um, that that men are becoming more like women and women are becoming more like men. And what this means from an archetypal standpoint is that that feminine side is sort of um, coming out more uh, in men and that masculine side is coming out more in women. And in women, you know, this sort of self-determination um, and sort of uh, not being controlled by others uh, is, is um, a consequence of their masculine side give, being given a degree of energy, which it wasn't in the past. Um, and you can link this to the feminine movement, feminism movement, um, um, where some people would argue that, that feminists or many feminists are possessed by their animus, which I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily agree that that's the case. Um, but there are definitely women who are, you know, are possessed by their animus and are kind of trying to inflict this animus identity or impose this animus identity onto other women and say that in order to be true women, you need to act more like men. But, you know, that's, it, it is kind of not, not necessarily true that, um, that in order for a woman to, to, you know, to be a woman, they need to act more like a man. They, you know, the feminine side of a woman is a very powerful force and, and should be experienced and kind of should be celebrated. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't right. be thinking of femininity as, as, you know, as necessarily a bad thing. And by femininity, I mean, all of the things which are traditionally associated with women. So motherhood, for example, and, you know, being more emotional, these things are kind of what, uh, mascu- what um, animus uh, possessed women um, degrade and think are bad and think are sort of repressive of women, but they are sort of what make women women to a certain extent. So it's this interesting counterpole in sort of this, sort of the social world and sort of the political world. Um, and I guess we'll just have to see how it plays out. <laughs> yeah, then there's also potential for anima possessed men and potentially I mean, the stereotype might be that male feminists are like that. Yeah, that's that's exactly right because because they are sort of their their feminine side is being a, given a degree of energy and a degree of it's having a degree of influence over their psyches, um, which is you know it could be that it could be their choice that they're just letting this feminine side um, sort of take over their psyches and not giving enough energy to their masculine side, or it could be a case, which I believe in, in certain cases where the feminine side of a man is just, is just uh, more powerful than the, than the masculine side. Um, and that's sort of, you know, men who are very effeminate, that's sort of the case with them. Does that mean they have animuses, even though they're men or, and the other way around, like if, if someone has, if you get a feminine a genuinely feminine man or mm-hmm. a genuinely feminine woman is it this the other round of the syzygy or is it i don't know what do you think good question great question um in different Jungian, so jung's original work he described the syzygy as being a totally or mostly an unconscious phenomenon so um so he would say like for example you're a man that's your sort of consciousness and if you're a woman, that's sort of like your, that's sort of your conscious personality or your outward personality. And that this syzygy anima or animus is your unconscious aspect. But I think it is more accurate to say that both men and women have an anima and animus. Um, and one of these is predominant most of the time and the other is unconscious most of the time. So in, oh. a, in an effeminate men, for example, or a feminine man, for example, uh, his anima is sort of possessing his personality to a greater extent, but he still has this uh, this masculine side that's being repressed into the unconscious. All right. So, uh, so what can you tell us about free will? Uh, good question. So I'm, I've been engaging with arguments um, for free will or against free will for a while. Um, and um, I've, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can approach the idea of free will, but to state it simply is that I do believe we do actually possess free will. Um, That doesn't mean we can control everything in our environments. That doesn't mean we're in total control. In fact, I believe we don't have that much control at all. You know, we're so uh, subject to so many different influences, like our, you know, our, the, the chemical constitution of our brains, for example and you know, our genetics and the environment we grow up in, all of these play an influence on us. And though somebody might say that because of that, we don't have free will. 
But what I'd argue is that you do still have a slight amount of free will. And the reason I say this, it's kind of a complex argument, but it, it does make sense. And I, I, at least I think it makes sense. And, um, but you do kind of have to bear it out, which is the fact that I believe that the psyche, you know, what our conscious experience, our emotions are, you know, the voice in your head, for example, your own thoughts, all of these things belong to your psyche. I believe that these things can transcend matter in a way in which matter can't predict them. So, so if you think about a person's brain and you try to imagine seeing every little detail inside their brain. So you can you use a microscope, use an electron microscope, whatever. You try to observe every single particle. Can you, based on that information, determine what the person is going to do next? Like, can you determine their behavior? And my answer is, the reason I say no is because all of that information, no matter how much of it you have, does not tell you what the person is thinking or what the person is feeling or what the person is conscious of. You know, fundamental information is missing from this picture because in my opinion, the universe isn't entirely materialistic. The psyche, it kind of exists in a plane on its own. And, you know, and a lot of people think this contradicts science, but I think but my response would be, first of all, the psyche is definitely real. So it's definitely a thing. It's definitely not matter because for example, if I just, if I close my eyes and just sort of think or like imagine an elephant, for example, that's the example I used. If I just sit there and imagine an elephant, it's like, okay, query that elephant doesn't exist, but I am seeing an elephant with my sort of mind's eye. So what is that? Like, what is that exactly? Is it matter? Like, can I, if I open your brain, can I find the elephant? It's like, no, it's composed of something else. It's not just matter. It's something else. And um, another sort of response I would give to the scientific people who might say, well, this is against science would be to say that there's no reason to think that uh, a biological organism couldn't evolve free will. Um, so for example, uh, if you know what a philosophical zombie is, a philosophical zombie is somebody or something that, that looks like a normal person, but has no conscious experience. I would argue that a philosophical zombie doesn't have free will, but we do since we're not philosophical zombies, that we can sort of, we can sort of rise above the physical world and have this sort of psychic dimension where we can see things and, and have a perspective that isn't just contained in matter. And so be able to rise above it and be able to exert what our sort of what our psyches want rather than what the matter in our bodies is just telling us or directing us to do. Yeah, I mean, free will doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing either. Like depending, someone might vary in how much free will they at least use like mm -hmm. throughout the day or throughout their life. Like if they, if, you know, if the subconscious content is possessing them more, they might have less free will than at other times. If they integrate mm -hmm. their shadow, they might gain more free will, right? And then there's the whole thing of the relationship between free will and determinism um, with these four different uh, possibilities. I'm not sure if you know about them. One of them is hard, there's hard determinism. One of them is called libertarianism, which has nothing to do with the politics, mm -hmm. which is libertarianism is the opposite of hard determinism, I think. Is that basically there's it states that there isn't determinism and there's free will. Hard determinism is that there's no free will and it's deterministic. Uh, compatibilism is that there's free will and it's deterministic. And then there's the other one, which is soft determinism, I think, maybe? No, mm -hmm. no, maybe not. I can't remember what the other one is. Uh, do you know about that? Um, yeah, I, I no, I've explored that for sure, but I forgot what it was called as well. Um, um, but it's somewhere between compatibilism or, and, um, and, uh, libertarianism, I think. It would be basically that there's, it's not that there's free will, but no, it'd be that there's determinism. No, be, there isn't determinism or free will. I think that's right. what it would be. Oh, right. Okay. Was one of them is that there's free will, but not the term. Oh, whatever, whatever. Uh, so you've got, what do we talk about now? By the way, how long do you plan on going on for? I don't really mind how it's going, but. Oh, um, I could, I could do a little bit longer if you want. It depends how it depends on you. Um, no, it's fine. Um, in one video, you mentioned the analog world. So what's mm -hmm. that about? 
Oh, yeah, this is a, another, this is the concept relating to the psyche and relating to sort of the difference between the psyche and reality, but it also relates to the human world and uh, how humans live in the world because we don't live in one world, we live in two worlds. We live in a world that's physical that I can feel and touch, but we also live in a world in our minds, which, which we impose upon the world to sort of allow it to make sense. Um, an analog, so an analog, according to Julian Jaynes, is sort of a model, uh, a model of reality that's meant to sort of bring about certain aspects of it so that they're easier to understand. And so a map is an analog, for example. A map is an analog of a piece of land. And a religion is an analog? Um, that's a good question. Um, I would say to an extent, yes, because like pretty much, pretty much anything, a lot of things are analogs um, that we just don't realize. But um, I think it's a bit more complicated than that. I think a religion, a religion is a, a bit, a bit more of a of a denser thing than just than just an analog. But um, like a map, the reason I say a map is an analog is because it corresponds to reality. So if I take a map of of a certain piece of land, that map represents reality and it also you know corresponds to it in certain ways like it shows you where the water is and it shows you where the roads are and whatever but there is still a distinction between the map and the land like they correspond to each other but one is supposed to represent the other now this is the same thing with our minds our minds are producing analogs of everything around us which are you know they correspond to reality but they are distinct from reality um so, and this is what consciousness is. You remember I was explaining, you, you asked what consciousness was before. And I said, um, you know, it's this kind of metaphorical, um, this metaphorical idea of the world in my mind, which I impose upon the world. Um, the, analog, the analog world is the same thing where it's the idea of the world, which I impose upon the world to sort of change it. Um, but there are a lot of things which belong to this analog world. Uh, money is, a great example because you know money is just you know it's just plastic it's just coins it's just metal it's just you know it's just physical stuff it doesn't actually have any value but our minds attribute a certain value to it and collective humanity attributes a value to it which would wouldn't exist if there were no humans so it's kind of just an imaginary concept um and all of our models in science are of the same nature so like the model of the atom is just an analog of what we think the of the atom actually is um and you know the fact that we have a calendar that we divide the the year into twelve months. You know, you know we're in December right now, but does an animal know it's in December? Does an does my dog know that it's December right now? Like it doesn't. Kind of, but not in terms of you know the labels. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It doesn't put the way it knows that it's winter. It knows that it's different from now relative to spring or whatever. But it doesn't it doesn't label it as December. It doesn't label it today as December eleventh. Another example would be like the streets that you live on or the country that you live in. Like we, I designate the piece of land I live in as Canada, but you know, the animals don't know that they don't see the distinction between the borders. That's just kind of a metaphysical imposition. I put on, put on this piece of land to change it and to form borders and stuff. And so there really is a world inside our minds and sort of in the collective mind of everybody that isn't actually there. It's just kind of, we make it to sort of, to sort of uh, make a living possible, if you get what I mean. Well, you say it isn't there, but are you sure about that? Ah, uh, yeah, they're very good, very good point. Because it is there, it's just of a different nature compared to compared to sort of the the world. It, it's it's very really hard to draw a distinction between these two things because we know that they're connected. But um, yeah, that's a good, really good point though, because it is there and it definitely does exist in a sense. It's just not as closely connected to the physical world as we you know, automatically assume. These things are invented by us. Um, I guess the better word rather than illus illusory would be invented. Right, yeah, yeah, I think <laughs> so. So, well, one thing you mentioned is, um, you know, the, the Dark Knight archetype and the trickster archetype mm -hmm. in relation to Batman. I, I, I assume it's relation to Batman anyway. Yes, yes. So, well, what's up with that then? Yeah, so 
Well, I mean, the trickster archetype itself is an archetype that appears all throughout mythology and all mm. throughout history and, you know, in your own life. And again, these archetypes are things inside your mind. So you've definitely experienced this before. Um, and I, I know I, I try to discuss these things in things that are people are familiar with. So I went with the Dark Knight because the Joker, Heath, Leather, Heath Ledger's Joker in the Dark Knight is a perfect encapsulation of this archetype. Um, not only that, but um, it's, he even seems to embody it better than than other sort of iterations of the Joker, which do ultimately depict the same archetype. It's just that Heath Ledger's was really good and really sort it of was, relevant. It was uh, that type of acting. Um, Method acting. Yeah. And some have claimed that he actually was possessed. Yeah, I've heard that as well, um, that, that, you know, he took his own life, which is really tragic. Um, but, you know, I can imagine him be- being this character for, for so long and so in- absorbed by it that he kind of had an identity crisis. You know, it's a very dark character to play because it's very cynical, very, you know, like, like the, the, if I, you know, we admire the Joker as a character, but I don't think anybody would want to meet this guy in real life because he's terrifying. Um, but what I what I did with that video was discuss sort of the um, the the archetype as it manifests um, in the movie as well as in you know in other depictions, and it's a very interesting archetype because we know it exists, we see it, we see it all the time, but it's not clear how this sort of you know it's not clear what the function of this archetype is because the anima it's clear because you know you need to find a woman who you're attracted to so that's you know that's the origin of the archetype, but something like the trickster, it it, it kind of emerges as a counterpole to civilization itself. And so what I mean by this is that- Maybe when as people are too serious and they need to sort of see the funny side, but also, mm-hmm. but there's also chaos needs a representative. Um, because obviously with this whole yin and yang thing, if there's too much order, it sort of ossifies and then it falls into chaos. And then chaos from chaos is what you get creation from. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, no, that, that's that's per- that's a perfect explanation. Um, it's it's so chaos itself um, does have a lot of different depictions because chaos is a very big idea. So there are depictions of chaos that are, you know, at the individual level and at the collective level. And there's chaos in nature and there's chaos in the psyche. Um, and the Joker is one of these depictions of chaos. And it's exactly what you said before, where, you know, why so serious? It's it's sort of like a counterpole to seriousness. Um, you can think of civilization as being this thing that's imposed upon you. It's like, okay, you got to follow these rules. You got to wear clothes. You got to do all these things that civilization demands that you do. But in your psyche, there's this desire to sort of break away from that to sort of, because you can think of civilization as imposing order upon you, but there's something in us that desires chaos that doesn't want to be controlled by an external authority. There's something that wants to break through. And there are political movements that appeal to chaos. For example, to some extent, uh, liberalism to some extent the left and to some extent libertarianism well i wouldn't even i wouldn't even say to some extent i would say that kind of is the archetype of liberalism because you can think of well it, liberalism in general is sort of reform a reform movement because it sees sort of um you know it's, it's a counterpole to conservatism because conservatism sees society as being good and wants to conserve that. But reform and liberalism by extension wants to change things. And so it kind of wants to introduce a measure of chaos to, to, to change things and make them better. It's like you said before, that chaos is kind of the birthplace of, of new and better things. Well, that's kind of the idea of liberalism that you want to change the world. It's not necessarily chaos, but it is, it is kind of chaotic in a sense that it does want to dismantle the established order and replace it with something new um you know and there are extreme versions of that like for example the russian revolution uh the rise of communism what about reactionism because that's kind of changing to how it was reactionary sorry can you explain that again so a reactionary movement i mean fascism is the most obvious example but there's i mean that it's maybe it's best not to go with that one because it's too obvious but like um i mean there are forms of traditionalism that aren't considered exceptional exceptionable like acceptable like uh christian traditionalism in much of the west is actually considered people look at it as a bit past it right 
Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and but at the same time, a change to make that the norm would be simultaneously chaotic as a change, but also to an old order. So yeah, you're de you're definitely right, and you're definitely um, definitely tapping or you know stating something which um, which is true. Um, but uh, how I would sort of sort of mesh these two ideas, which seem to oppose each other, is that. Um, is that in any given um, society, there is something in the present which is considered the norm. So if you wanna, for example, if we're talking about the West right now, if you wanna, it's like you said, it's like you, it's, it's exactly like you said, um, where if you wanna go back to Christian traditionalism, um, you're essentially, it is kind of like a chaotic thing, but you're reverting back to something which is considered you know, old and considered um, archaic. But at the same time, since you're changing society, there is sort of a liberal element to it. Um, so I'd say like, like at every point, society sort of has something that it defines as the norm and attempting to preserve that would be conservatism and attempting to change that would be reform or liberalism. And I guess centrism? reactionism. Centrism, I guess, would be some, some attempt to find balance between those two, those two um, opposing things. I've come across an idea, which is about instead of trying to find a balance between different things whether it's the left or the right or anything mm -hmm. that you can instead try to integrate them together to create something new that is made of the two opposites that sounds that sounds like a perfect solution <laughs> for the perfect for the predicament that we're in right now um well it depends what you know what we preserve and what we what we discard because you could um, also create the worst possible system it's almost like the opposite form of the opposite of an integration or a positive integration would be a negative integration. So that would be maybe that, I mean, fascism has been called the third position. And so in a sense, perhaps fascism is a net, the opposite of that, a dark integration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's a, you, another thing you're bringing up there is the, is I don't like to think of the political spectrum. I mentioned this in one of my videos. I, I don't like to think of the political spectrum as a spectrum where like fascism's on the right and then communism on the left. I think each ideology kind of doesn't doesn't necessarily belong on a spectrum. Just, they're just kind of, you know, independent and exist uh, not necessarily as poles of each other. But like a like, Venn diagram or a whole set of bubbles. More like a whole set of bubbles, right? Where like I guess I guess a Venn diagram between certain poles because some things are clearly opposites from each other. But I don't like to think in terms of opposites because again, that sort of that sort of idea plays into our shadow psychology where we divide into two and then sort of view the other side as the bad guy. Because if you put everything on a pole, you just place yourself on one pole and the other guy in the other pole, and they're the evil and we're the good guys. So it, it kind of plays into that. So um, that's why I prefer not to think of. Uh, yeah, if you were, really, yeah, to truly integrate, you'd want to not be creating a new opposite necessarily, but really you're going to keep the two opposite sides of it. So, I mean, the problem with when people talk about centrism, I mean, the, the biggest problem that's identified by people who aren't centrist is that it's basically the Overton window and just sticking things as they've been before. And if you have a problem with how the status quo, then it's just basically keeping things as they are. And, you know, they might look to the elites and say, well, this center is like identified with the elites. Now, obviously there's people who identify the opposite side as the problem, like conservatives see liberals as a problem, liberals see conservatives as a problem, but there's at least a fair few people who see the center as a problem. Mm -hmm. But the say, but then, can the answer really be just to choose an, an extreme and to go with that pole? Like, I, I'm not sure about that either. Yeah, it's really complicated. It's, it's, it's really hard to see like how, what is the best way to go forward? So what I, I would say is look at what, look at different political ideas and like, what does each of them get right and try to look at it in an open mind and then try to construct something new that has features of all of them. Yeah, I, I agree. That's that's kind of been how I've been been trying to approach politics because there are elements of, for example, uh, in you know in the U.S. sort of political spectrum. I guess in the U.K. would be different, but also very similar, um, where there are elements of both sides that I 
do agree with. Um, and so I built, I try to build my political sort of beliefs, um, not from choosing one side or the other, but seeing what both sides have to offer. And that's, you know, that's, I think, I think this is the best way to go about it. But at the same time, at the same time, like I, I, you know, people, you know, we tend to, we tend to think of ourselves as an ideology sometimes, you know, people who are really ideologically possessed, they kind of identify with their ideology to the point where there's no individual there. There's just kind of a person with an ideology. But um, what, I, what I argued before and what Jung would have argued is that when you identify with an ideology, everything inside of you that agrees with the opposite ideology becomes repressed, but it's still there. So, you know, there, you know there's, I, I definitely think that there are conservatives who are hardline conservatives that have a liberal element in their psyche that just doesn't sort of find expression or is projected outwards and seen as evil. Um, but yeah, it's it, you know it's a hard thing. It's hard, it's it's hard to find the appropriate middle path because centrism, you know, centrism itself is kind of like an ideology. And mm. if you adopt centrism, you're kind of adopting a certain set of beliefs. Um, but I think each issue needs to be considered independently um, in order to form sort of an individuated view of of uh, of how we should proceed politically. Yeah, I mean, what would the Ubermensch do, right? Yeah. Exactly. Well, how would he define his own sort of beliefs? You know, he doesn't just do what everyone else does. He he determines them all based on his own values. Right. You know, it's fascinating that the Nazis <clears throat> seem to, or at least the, they, they seem to refer to Nietzsche, like, in a positive way, despite the fact that the, the real Ubermensch is the exact opposite of someone who just follows the party and the country in an unconscious way yeah it's funny that you mentioned that because Nietzsche hated anti-semites he 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 would write about anti-semites as being the stupidest people um um especially because he admired the Jewish religion a lot um and he admired sort of its its sort of um brave masculine element and also he admired the fact that they kind of engaged in an inversion of uh, morality um which is another big Nietzschean theme which is um Kind of, kind of a big topic, so it's hard to get into now. But I can briefly explain it. All right. It's like um, essentially where um, uh, a civilization defines morality based on being superior and being great and everything, um, but the slave class, like the sort of lower people in society, invert that morality to make the sort of virtues of the slave—that's his word—be um, the standard morality. So a good example of this would be Christianity. Where a lot of the things in Christianity, like humility and you know, um, pity and things like that, would have been considered bad by the Romans, but were considered good qualities by sort of the the people that the Romans were um, um, occupying. Yeah, that's a good point. So, you know, I had an idea of a question, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I lost it as you're explaining that. You in one video you mention shaman and kings. What's that? Uh, yeah, so there's it's a, all these things have like really big, you know, different directions I can sort of take, sort of explain. Um, but but this video, I, if I recall properly, um, was an extension to the sort of bicameral mind idea and sort of a modification to it, where it's queer in history. And there are tons of examples, and I, I, it's almost like I want to I want to just go back and study so much more history to find the more examples of these, where it's clear that uh, some sort of leader, some sort of king, emperor, uh, tribal leader, even that they did not think of themselves as the leader. They didn't think of themselves as the king. They just thought of themselves as, as the emissary for a god. Uh, one example of this, the example I bring up all the time, and then I'm probably going to bring up in the future, is Hammurabi. So if you know Hammurabi, he was a Mesopotamian king. I believe he was king of Babylon, but I could be could be mistaken. Might have been somewhere else. Um, but he his law code, the the code of Hammurabi, you know, it's one of the earliest law codes in history. It's very interesting. Um, very, you know, we we think of it as archaic because it's the you know it's the eye for an eye sort of justice um, in this law code. But he, Hammurabi, if you read the code, he's not, he doesn't say, and I, Hammurabi, decree these things. He says, he, he basically says, listen, 
I didn't come up with this law. Shamash did. And Shamash being a Mesopotamian god. Shamash told me the law. He communicated to me and I just wrote it down. And so this idea of the shaman king, what it actually is, is these, these kings who, who communicate with a supernatural entity. And it is by doing so that they lead. Or um, aliens. <laughs> yeah, potentially aliens. Um, um, you know, it depends how, how things evolve. And, you know, that, that's interesting. I, I'll just, you know, I go on tangents a lot, but I'll briefly mention is that, you know, I don't, I'm not sure how an alien would evolve consciousness the same way we would, because I'd, I'd say that one of the things that caused our consciousness is our belief in gods. But it's possible that aliens come to the same sort of consciousness by another method. Um, but anyways, that's a tangent to what I was saying. What else? But uh, with the shaman kings, it's essentially, um, essentially, the fact that they can communicate with this other world that they believe that they're communicating with this other world that gives them authority to lead. And again, we we have to ask from a psychological perspective, what is this other world? Well, I would say it's the world of the right hemisphere, which is able to synthesize ideas that come from the left hemisphere and sort of, um, in a commanding way, sort of. Uh, 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 give that information to the conscious ego. Yeah, I can't remember his name, but I, I do recall that I think it was the Iroquois Confederation or, or one of these confederate, one of these tribes, mm -hmm. uh, when they were fighting, they were fighting with the Americans against the British, and there was this warrior. There's two brothers. One of them's a warrior, and one of them was a shaman. And so the shaman was a leader in his own right, but obviously a shaman would be communicating with the gods. And that's an entirely different archetype of leader, I suppose, to the the warrior. Although it is possible that the two could be combined. Yeah, they 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 could be combined. And in fact, I'd say in a lot of cases they are because um, one, I mean. I mean, it goes best. It goes back to what you said before that the Nazis really loved the idea of the Ubermensch, but again, that idea, it, you know, one of the things I noticed a lot in history is that people who are very individuated, although they're, you know, it's very good for them to be individuated and very, you know, independent. Those types of people tend to become the leaders who then sort of cause this sort of slave-mindedness in other people, and so. You know, in an ideal world, everybody can be super individuated and super, you know, independent and super, um, you know, themselves and not, you know, not slaves to other people. But, um, you know, I don't know what you think, if that picture maybe, is unrealistic. Or... Maybe, I know, I think that that's what we're moving towards now and it'll come sooner than we think. Right. Yeah, I think, I think that is sort of the trend of history. You know, if we look back in like ancient Egypt, very early ancient Egypt, like, I mean, I don't want to insult the Egyptians. I love them, but like they were very slave-minded. They were very obedient to their to their uh, pharaohs, um, and um, and but of course throughout history, um, and I'd say this is one of the reasons that we've developed an ego in the first place is to become more independent. Um, and throughout history, we bec we're becoming more and more independent. But at you know sometimes you you know you see places like. Um, like the CCP in China that are really authoritative authoritarian governments that sort of force people to, you know, behave a certain way. Um, you know, you see things like that. So this, this trend towards individuation isn't always true in, in all cases. Yeah, that's certainly true. Um, you know, it's kind of tragic when I'm to China because it used to be the, one of those civilized places Mm -hmm. but now well it's pretty authoritarian right yeah terribly so what do you think what do you know about the kabbalah and what do you think about it um i don't know much and i'd love to know more and i'm always trying to study this this topic but uh it's it's really it's um related to jewish mysticism um which uh so it's is I'm really interested in it, and it's it um, it is kind of like one of those very satisfying things to learn about because the the Kabbalists, who were these early Jewish myst uh, mystics, the way they sort of describe reality and the way they sort of sort of um, present a picture of reality as this ever increasing trend towards unity, um, it's very beautiful and it's very satisfying to hear. 
Um, but I'm not exactly the, the right person to be asking about this or, because it's not something that I'm, that I know too much about. Uh, but I do really enjoy sort of listening to it and um, the sort of concepts, a lot of the concepts in, in Kabbalah um, are, you do have an archetypal meaning and do have um, uh, um, sort of a, a wider archetypal significance. For example, um, a recent Kabbalist, um, he sort of re, he sort of re-represented the idea of God um, in a very interesting way where we normally think of God as this masculine entity but he described God as having this also this counter pole, this feminine side, which is important to the God picture. It's almost as if God is hermaphroditic. God doesn't really have a gender the way we think of gender. But right. it's... the Jung talked about this, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we carry on, Karen. No, so yeah, it's no, it's that's you know that's that's right. Jung Jung did uh, um, approach this topic and sort of uh, use it as an example of of archetypes and um, how certain symbols uh, recur throughout history. Also like the unification of opposites and the in integration of the shadow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but as you were saying. Uh, yeah, but um, you know, that's, it's, it is a really interesting topic and it's something that Eric Neumann also, who's that Jungian, one of Jung's students, um, he mentioned it in his book, uh, The Origins and History of Consciousness as, as a symbol for the union of opposites. Um, but again, the, the, the union of opposites is one symbol, but the division of opposites is another symbol, which is also important because you know the union of opposites is, is, is the, the, the symbol of the self, but the division of opposites is the symbol of the ego dividing from the self. And so, you know, different symbols have different meanings and different contexts. And um, you could say that first you exist as a self, you know, when you're a baby, you're just yourself. Then you begin to develop this ego, which divides from yourself um, and becomes a sort of representation of yourself, which you present to the world. But then when your ego dies at the necessary time, whenever that is, you know, it could happen many times, your ego will fall back into the unconscious. Those opposites will unify and you will transcend your own ego and sort of your, your conscious ego will um, sort of uh, incorporate more ideas and more become wider, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, and with the idea of incarnation, I mean, this whole process would just repeat itself. Mm -hmm. which is fascinating so do you think do you think that it will repeat itself infinitely or is there a point at which it ceases and i think it would repeat itself in new forms um according to my spirituality well there's definitely things that i'm unsure about but there's different levels and so we're on the third level now the fourth there's a fourth level where we have a part light body apparently uh the fifth which is an, and it's about love the fifth level is about wisdom and, and at that level we don't have a physical body at all which is entirely a light body mm -hmm. and at sixth level it's a thought form body so it's kind of like like the christ consciousness or something right and is this like is the are these like separate incarnations or like does each level There's have a like certain number or something like that yeah you would encounter a number of times at each level until you master it and can get to the next one ah i see okay super interesting and and yeah, it's called the law of one if you're curious law of one okay i'll definitely look into that yeah that, that sounds very interesting that's interesting for a couple of different reasons because yeah. of course you could say like the archetypal reason you know but that's you know the archetypal reason is just kind of a way to diminish these things i mean i i, lo I love studying archetypes and stuff no, but I it mean, is kind of a rash like a way to rationalize these things i mean Sorry, that's, go ahead. i mean looking into the archetypal aspect of it is actually something i mean i'd be really interested in seeing your thoughts on that from that perspective Although obviously you're right that looking at it in its own right, the, the sort of the spirituality or mysticism is also very much a fascinating thing to go into. Mm -hmm. I will I will say this one thing though about the archetypes is that the archetypes are the origin of human knowledge because we start in this archetypal body. It's just kind of like, it's just filled with instincts. But when we can sort of use these archetypes to describe other things, like, so for example, the first thing you encounter is your mother. Well, if you begin to think of the world as kind of your mother, you've kind of, you've kind of applied that archetypal idea in a different context. And so gained sort of a different understanding of what the world is, right? So in a sense, 
even though we talk about the archetypal um, and the sort of archetypal connections between things, because of the archetypes and because of our archetypal nature, it's we are able to understand these things. For example, you know, we we could you know we could still we we you could imagine a scenario where we're where we're still relatively um, unevolved and we don't understand the world as well as we could. Um, um, but it is sort of through archetypes and sort of through the the way they operate that we do gain an understanding of the world and we transcend um, sort of our our instinctual life, um, you could say. Okay, so I'm thinking we could finish off pretty soon, but okay. I'm curious, you mentioned deification and we haven't mentioned Trump yet. So what do you <laughs> think of the hypothetical, you know, how Trump is deified almost by some people? Good question. Um, he definitely is being viewed as almost like a deity by a lot of people. Um, and I think that's dangerous because I don't think, you know, okay, like it's a complicated subject because there have been deification essentially is, um, you know, we think of it as like, as like you think of somebody as a God, even though they're not, but you know, in ancient past people were deified and they were genuinely believed to be God. So Caesar, for example, was believed to be a God. Well, why was he believed to be a God? Well, on one, in, on one side it's because he had so much power and influence and his, his, you know, his followers were super fanatic, fanatical. But and on the victories. other side, sorry? And his victories. Yeah, and his victories were like super impressive, right? Um, when we're, you know, phenomenal to, 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 to study about. And, um, and so this man who was just a person seemed to be almost like a deity. Um, but I'm concerned with the sort of deification of Trump because first of all, we shouldn't deify humans. You know, humans aren't gods. We might, we might be godlike. Some of us might be godlike in certain respects, but we're definitely not. We're not like close to deities um, as they're normally conceived. Um, but at the same time, I'm concerned that the deification of Trump isn't based on Trump's qualities himself, but rather as people seeing Trump as a representation of their own hatred of the other side. So it's like it goes back and to what we were saying before. And also people, yeah, there's also how people hate him as well. And this is both ways. There's a yeah. psychological process going on. Yeah, yeah. People, people hate him with the same intensity that other people love him. And so he becomes the object of shadow projection. Um, but it's almost like it's almost like he's becoming the monster that people because I, I didn't think Trump was that bad at first, but I do think people pushed him and sort of prodded him and he sort of became more monstrous as a result. Um, hmm. Because because like, I mean, I don't if you think about the way the media treats him. It's like if he sees that, he kind of starts to embody that that image that we project upon him. Um, and I don't, you know, and you know, if we deify him, it's it becomes a very dangerous situation because that means that his children are deified and that they're their rightful rulers or whatever. Because you know, deified individuals in history often become kings and often become dictators. Caesar became dictator for life. Um, he wasn't deified while he lived, but you know, he was getting close to that to that. And then after you deify somebody and you, be, you, be, you, be, you begin to treat them as inhuman and beyond human, and you're giving them way more power than they arguably deserve. Um, and, and so, you know, there's a, it, it, is, it is quite dangerous. And I do think it is archetypal. It, it relates back to that father archetype that I was talking about. There's something in us that wants to look upwards and find somebody to admire. And I think a lot of people are projecting their, their, their uh, father archetype um, onto Trump and seeing him as a father figure, like a collective father figure. Um, but that's very dangerous because that means you're sort of surrendering your own agency and your own sense of will to somebody else, to some sort of leader. Um, but you could say can, some people, the same thing seems to be happening with Bill Gates. Yeah, it's, exactly. Thing. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, there's a lot of, there's, it's, it's really interesting because to the extent that people like Bill Gates, there's also people who hate Bill Gates. Um, and it's, it's almost like the same thing with Trump. And, and Bill Gates has an immense amount of power. And like, do you really want this guy to be calling the shots on so many things? Some people say yes, because, you know, he's a smart guy. He's no, he knows what he's doing. But other people will say no, because one person shouldn't have that much, that level of influence. Of course, this is interesting. Actually, there's conspiracy theories about both figures, actually. 
Yeah. And then <laughs> there's all the Q and on thing, and then there's uh, yeah. the idea, and then the idea of what? Then there's the, the idea that the virus is not just Bill Gates, but that there's the cabal behind it. And yeah. Stuff. I, I don't like to buy into conspiracy theories unless I like there's evidence, you know, <laughs> like if I mean, I respect that. I mean, I'm not so concerned about the evidence anymore. I, I don't know why, but I mean, to me, it's like, I mean, intuitively, you can see connections and I know that's not perfect, but sometimes you can discern things that you can't prove and yet right. it will be right. Right. Yeah, definitely. No, I, I, yeah, that's, that's definitely true. But the, one of the, another reason I don't buy into the, I mean, I mean, it depends on the conspiracy because there's some that I could see as being plausible. And then there's others that, that I could, because they're plausible, you could see how it's true and um, you know, things like that. But um, I think that there's a lot of terrible things that are occurring that you don't need to be a conspiracy theorist to see and believe, you know, the world is terrible enough as it is in a lot of ways, not in every way, but in a lot of ways without sort of conspiracies to make it worse <laughs> i suppose so and like there, there's genuine corruption there's genuine corruption that people are seeing like it's right in front of you you don't need to you don't need to believe in things that you can't actually perceive to see that there's corruption and i think obviously the things that we couldn't can see and that we can prove are the things we should be you know more concerned about not necessarily more concerned about but at least they should be given a share of our concern yeah all right. I mean, that's that's a respectable position. Uh, you know, we've talked about a lot of things, and well, it's been pretty interesting. So, is there anything you haven't mentioned yet that you'd really you really wanted to explore before we finish off? Um, I'd. Uh... Hmm. Good question. Um. Well, in terms of the. The things I've said, I've pretty much laid out everything that I've discussed on my channel and probably will be discussing on my channel for some time. So like this, this uh, discussion was a pretty good overarching um, um, sort of thing to, to, to explain what I'm all about. Um, but I would like to know your thoughts. Um, I think we already, we already discussed it a little bit, but if, um, if you could don't mind uh, talking oh, about about the um, the sort of uh, connection between uh, the simulation hypothesis and um, and uh, spirituality and if they're connected and what they sort of imply about each other. Right. So there's this idea in among people who believe in the law of one or or they talk about the great awakening. There's this idea of we are eternal souls living temporary experiences and that what it is this holographic universe and that basically what we experience in the physical world well first of all there's as you said there's between external quote external reality and what we perceive there's a filter and secondly the idea is that we're souls in bodies to, to experience this. And we forget, we forget our, we've got amnesia about our previous lives, usually, so mm -hmm. that it's a unique experience every time with a unique choice about whether we're, we want to like help other people or whether we want to just be self-serving. Um, and so, in a sense, we, it's almost pantheism is the kind of the concept behind mm -hmm. it. Right. Where we are, each soul is in a sense, but you know, the self is linked to the idea of the soul of, of God mm -hmm. in Jungian psychology. So it's a bit like, yeah, each soul is fundamentally a little splinter or a little piece of, the overall overall god right i mean you could even go in this idea of in a um fractal kind of way or that there's each soul is a universe even and the and vice and vice versa for the whole universe being a soul and it's being infinite in every direction right yeah that's so it's almost like we we 
are God, but also simultaneously not God because right. we're just split off from it. Yeah, it's a small set that God, part of a creation is that to experience itself, it broke itself off up into lots of little pieces. Right. Like God is like disassociated almost. Right. You know where, uh, you know where that... Oh, there's sorry. one other thing I wanted to mention, which is like, because it's the other holographic universe, it would be that if we are the creator, we are creators and we can create reality like the law of attraction. Um, you might have heard of it. But the created is the the physical universe that we see. Right. So Yeah. Uh, yeah. So no, that's 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 the what, what I wanted to mention. I what I wanted to interject was um, uh, there's a there's an interesting place where that idea appears. The idea of like God splitting himself up to appear as different beings. Um, sorry, sorry to to experience the world from different perspectives. Um, it's kind of unexpected. But if you know the the Lord of the Rings, um, the sort of there's like a Bible for the Lord of the Rings called the Silmarillion. Yeah, I've read it. Yeah. Oh, great. Awesome. And that's that actually appears at the very beginning where, um, what's the name? Eru splits his, his mind into these different uh, angelic beings and they each sort of understand a portion of existence, but they can't sort of understand each other's portion of existence. Oh, and then there's just all this music that they're playing. And Melkor basically decides to go in a different direction because he wants to, It's I guess he's self-serving. He's got his own it was about yeah. glorifying himself and what he wants to do rather than working together as the whole with the whole the creation yeah um and discord. that links to the idea of yeah discord but it also links to the idea of energy everything you know, um if you want to understand the universe think of energy frequency and vibration so <laughs> yeah that's also a very archetypal story and a very deep I don't even know uh, who, like, how it was inspired because I know that uh, Tolkien's inspiration was mostly from Christianity, but that sounds like a very, um, almost sounds like inspired by Hinduism and a lot of different other influences. Uh, but yeah, that's also, you know, <laughs> sorry to mention that because it's kind of random, but yeah. <laughs> you know, Hinduism is definitely, honestly, my spirituality, the Lord of One, does have things in common with hinduism now there's two ways of looking at this it would be one would be okay well people in the new age movement saw hinduism and then there's made stuff up inspired by it mm -hmm. the other one would be that hinduism and certain other like native american spirituality and certain others are actually closer to the truth and that's why it has a lot of similarity to new age movement so people who believe in new age stuff would just be like well those movements are just closer to the truth. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so, I mean, I feel like um, I'm not sure if you'll have much to talk about <laughs> in your, on, your, on your YouTube channel after this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I still do have a couple of topics that are upcoming. Um, and I, I'm joking. I'm sure you have a lot to talk about. <laughs> But yeah, it's um, it's really interesting. That was over two hours. Yeah, <laughs> time kind of yeah got away from me. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, my longest episode was like an hour, no, two and a half hours. So we're not uh, we're not there yet. So I, I feel like yeah. Uh, what I liked about this is how we touched on Jung a bit more. We touched on politics and the spirituality. So we put all brought it all together. So I really enjoyed this. Yeah, I did as well. I, that was a really great conversation. Uh, brought a lot of different themes together and sort of saw the connection between them. All right. So, um, well, I also, I think I said your name wrong. You're Theoran, right? Oh, no, that that's that, that was that's actually a mistake on my computer. <laughs> it's I don't know why Zoom does that. It's it's T-Pan. There's T-Pan. Oh, I actually did get it right. Huh? Yeah, you got it right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why th my name there says Theran, but that's, yeah, that's, that's wrong. <laughs> All right. Well, um, great conversation. Maybe I can interview you again. Yeah. I'm not sure what we'll talk about, but. Uh... <laughs> All right. Have a nice evening. You as well. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye.